what you're looking at is a Rock Slash Viva Arms ZB26. This is a very, very, very rare gun. 250 were made. It did not look like this when I got it. This has to be the longest, toughest job I've ever had to do. And it was down to the fact that as much as you're meant to keep the gun looking like the real thing, which is very much what I'm into, there are a few little niggles that any real avid user or wanter of one of these guns, it doesn't look like the real thing. Now there are fucking huge problems with this design, the way they've built it, the parts they've manufactured, what they've made them out of, everything about this is terrible. Inside here you find a basic M14 gearbox. Just a basic M14 gearbox. It doesn't have the motor cage, it doesn't have anything on the outside of it, it is just the gearbox and the nozzle, the piss and the gears, all of it normal M14. Now that's good because it's a very easy gun to work on and when you've just got that gearbox that's really 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 easy. Almost no parts inside it because everything on an M14 is on the outside of the gearbox and getting to it on an M14 is a shit. I like they used that gearbox. The gearbox, no problem. No problem. That's the only thing that was good about it. And obviously Viva slash Rock or whoever, they didn't have any input into making that gearbox. They just went, yep, one of them and put it in. What's wrong with this is everything else. Everything else. This video is basically what I believe to be the top, I hate that, what I believe to be, in my opinion, no. What I fucking know are the worst fucking airsoft guns you can get, period. But bear with me, because although this is the hardest job I've ever done, and the longest job I've ever done, this was not actually, I don't consider this to be the worst airsoft gun. You can't rate it on that. They made 250. Now these things, I was looking and uh, Cunt Hub, what are you going to call it, Reddit, they, there's a guy on there and he's selling off like fucking $1,500. And he's getting bites. People are interested. You know? It's happening. This is worth a lot of money. Now the guy picked this up in a Black Friday sale back in, uh, well, I think he said 2020, and he got it for like 400 quid, I think, or something like that. So the plan was to make it what it should have been in the first place, but not going over the budget of the actual gun. And they were around the eight or nine hundred dollar mark when they came out. But you can't judge this gun against a mass assembly line weapon. You can't do it because they made 250, you know? The profit margin for the people who made this gun, if they made 250, was probably about 50 or 60, 100 quid. That's probably they made, let's be very fair, 200 quid per gun. You know, they made 250 of these for like fucking 200 pound a gun. It's, it's just, you know, so it's not surprising that it's shit. It doesn't excuse some of the fuck ups. Now, the biggest fuck up in my opinion is the mag. That is an M14 mag. It's obviously an M14 mag. Obviously, right? But when you lay it side by side with an M14 mag, you see it's different. That's got a hole at the front. That's got a nub at the front. That is a different shape to that. These, you can push and hold it and it feeds, but you can't use M14 mags. And it boggles my mind as to why they would choose to not use M14 mags from any Chinese manufacturer and instead go with ones that are completely different. It boggles my mind, absolutely boggles my mind. So spare mags for these, they don't exist. The biggest problem for the guy aside from that was A, it sounded like shit. Now on the back of the gearbox, the M14 gearbox, they'd machined an aluminium two-piece bracket to hold the motor. The motor was the cheapest, cheapest four quid motor you can get, you know, and that motor that they used was off spec, which means it was actually very, very, very slightly shorter or slightly longer, I can't remember, than a normal short shaft motor. It wasn't medium shaft, it wasn't short shaft, it was somewhere in between. So you couldn't change motor. 
So I had to do massive modifications. After I'd shimmed the gearbox and changed the piston and the spring and that, I had to do massive modifications to that bracket so that I could fit any other kind of motor in there. And eventually that was fine. It's just a micro switch. Okay, safe. Micro switch. The real thing has got a semi and full selection mode. I know a way that I could do it, but this has already taken four days. So it's just not worth it. The hop unit is terrible. Now, look inside here. You can just about see the nozzle poking through. What you've got there is this top plate. And what this top plate does, that just sits there so the BBs can load into here and drop into the actual hop unit. That moves, so if you don't keep those fucking screws tight, it will move. But obviously, they had to make it so that everything was able to go in and out properly, and uh, and they've made it so it slides. And you don't really want that. That's, that's not something you want. The hop unit, you see the adjuster, there's a grub screw. That's the adjuster, a grub screw. I tried with the ball bearing, I tried with the rubber nub, I tried everything, and every time the same. And that is the gun out the box is doing around 300 feet per second. By the time you'd set the hop for a 0.2, it had dropped to around 200 feet per second. And if you tried to hop 0.25, the whole thing would jam up and clog. The hop unit, you know, there is nothing I can do with that because it's, it's particular. Only this gun has it and it's not plausible to put anything else in there because the actual aluminium hop unit is, is machined that way. That's how they've done it. It's, it's made particularly for this. You can detach the barrel. You lift this up, you push the barrel forward, and then you drop that down again. And you can take the whole thing out. I'm not doing that, because it's a fucking wanker. It's a wanker. In fact, the best way I found of getting the gun back together is to take the inner barrel out of the outer barrel, insert that first, then take the outer barrel, get that on, push that in the right place, and then use the arm and wiggle it in place. And even then, because it's such a long gun, you're doing it, and I'm not kidding, it is absolute, that's touching the wall, right? It is absolutely fucking huge. So when you're trying to do that, it's awful. That's the easiest way of doing it. Cylinder size versus barrel length. This barrel is what, 600 millimeters? It's big, right? It's not quite uh, MG42, but it's big. And it's not quite enough volume there. It's why I had to use an oversized cylinder and all that kind of stuff to try and get the volume up so that it didn't just drop off. But again, 0.25s is pretty much the max this is ever, ever going to do. But the guy knows this is basically a wall hanger. Now, the bits that were bugging him that I, if I, if I really wanted one of these guns, and I, as you know, I don't like World War One, World War II kind of stuff. It's a couple of guns that I've got, like Browning High Powers, but I, I don't like it. You can see all this stuff here. We've got uh, welding and um, rivet marks and so forth. That was all me. Because this unit, when it comes in, so that plate sit here, this whole bracket is made of the the softest, nastiest Mazak. And it doesn't sit there, it sits there. And there is a gap, and I mean, like, there's a fucking gap, dude. It's a big fucking gap. He wanted me to close that gap up. And I thought, fucking hell. Because you can't just bend it in place, it will snap. You can't cut it and bend it, because that will become a weak point and snap. You can't weld it because it's too shitty a material you know they mix things like sand and stuff in with the aluminium when they cast this it's the cheapest cheapest cast crap so i had to take this entire unit and shift it so cut it so it was straight and that is without touching any of this now these side panels are blued 7075 aircraft grade aluminium so that's all fucking anodized in the blue and the black over the top to make it nice which not how the gun looks so I don't want to have to start modifying that because that's going to take ages. So it's a case of, you know, I can't just move that piece up or I, I can't extend it backwards. You can't add material. So you have to move this that way. So by shifting the whole thing that way, this unit here, so imagine it's this shape like that, that unit then drops down there. So now your pistol grip doesn't go on and the gearbox doesn't fit in. So you have to do more modifications to all this stuff massive task that was a long fucking task now to pin everything together ordinarily take the gun apart all you're doing is you're taking a big bolt out of here a big bolt out of here bolt bolt clunk that comes off not anymore that 
is now on there permanently. Because if you look at this one here, that is a steel uh, self-tapping screw. I've drilled through this back bracket all the way through, added that screw and zipped it off. It's gone. Then these here, I took out the, the, the bolts that were there, added big fat grub screws, put the grub screws in so they were just touching on this top plate, which is a separate section, and then bored it out to make it look like a rivet. And then I still wasn't happy with it, so I built on top of it fake weld. So that way it looks like it's been welded together, as you can see. I've done set dress for films and things like that and uh, props and things. So these are little things that people do. And if you get it right, you know, it works out really well. The real thing would not be welded there. But if it was repaired, it would be welded there. So I decided that's what I'm going to go with. Same thing on this side. Weld. But it's not. This means the whole thing could shift and be held in place. Uh, the stock was really loose. Two screws, one there, one there from the inside. Uh, so that had to be tightened in and use a fatter gauge of screw. The butt pad was driving in mental because this unit here is just held in with one of these screws. You might recognize that from the inside of any M4 pistol grip. And I'm not kidding, that's exactly what they use. Uh, and the idea is you take a screw out and then you can get to your battery. Well, on here is this plate. And what this does, that is basically the brace. And I've had to modify this brace because literally it just flapped around. So this here, now locks in place. And it takes a bit of pressure and it goes. It's still not up to the standard where it actually acts as a brace, but it's not flopping around like a fucking saggy dick. I had to remove material from the inside of the pistol grip and I had to remove it from the back as well so that I could then seat this higher. This now has to sit higher to accommodate the work I've done here. If you look up in this gap, you can see where there's a step and it jumps up there because obviously this now sits down lower, but you can't see it when it's just completely side on. It's a travesty of a design. It's absolutely terrible. It's terrible, but you can't judge it on how it performs like that because let's face it, this in, ow. You can't judge it on how it looks now because this is not how it looked when it came in. Now this is the original feed cover that's how it looks. That's the original colouring. I decided to match the rest of the gun. I put some wear on the whole thing, so if you rub on it, you'll get through to silver finishing. And I've literally layered on micron fine layers of airbrushing. So if you look at it, uh, I basically laid, done all the, 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 I used a fucking file like this. And I just, very, very gently over every single edge, every raised area, I did a fine line of it. And then I sprayed over it with a mixture. It was like um, two parts silver, three part black. And I just went over all the edges airbrushed in silver. Then I mixed in a touch of blue and I mixed in even more black. So it became like uh, one part silver, one part blue, and then like 20 parts black. And I laid that over top again, but again, loads of fucking loads loads and loads and loads of thinner and then laid it on like a, a wash uh, with the airbrush and I did that and I added more silvers and blacks and things to create this exact same color on the gun that matches this color that is untouched that is exactly how that looks that is so when I close that up you can see the whole thing matches in colour and tone. Keeping everything working was important. Keeping everything here working was important. But you can see the quality of the original way they've done it with these little nuts and things. It's just not good. It's really not good. But it does mean that if he bangs it or knocks it, what's going to happen is it's going to wear away on these edges. And it shows through this very, very, very fine amount of wear rather than going straight through to some black paint or some anodized fucking blue or some cast greys. You know, it's gonna, it's gonna be a wall hanger. But he had the budget to make it what it's meant to be. You can't call this, yes, this is pretty much the worst thing I've ever worked on, all right? But you can't judge this against a factory um, assembly line gun where they're pumping out one after the other because it's a limited run. 
you know, limited run guns like the Tech 9 by Arms Revolution, that is pretty much the worst thing ever. I, I've never had a gas gun that bad, ever. But do you know what? I can't judge it because they made so few. Uh, E-Hobby Asia had them when I used to work for fucking Airsoft Armoury. And I got three in. That's, I've never, I don't know anyone that's got one apart from me and the two guys I got them for. I, I don't know who else has got them. So you can't judge it on that. But if you want to really, really talk about guns that are just full on, it shouldn't be this bad because they're making and pumping out so many at such a high price, this is where it's going to get interesting. Anyway, a tech thing, enjoy. The Crytek Vector, if you look at the real thing, it is front heavy, it is uncomfortable, it doesn't work so great. And it does look like a fucking VHS cassette player on a stick. And there are so many buttons on it. How many fucking buttons do you fucking need on one of those guns? So, okay, it's ambidextrous as all fuck, and you've got all these things you can do. There are so many levers and buttons, it's just fucking confusing. And then we try and get airsoft internals in it, forget about it. Now, the Crytac is probably the best out of the three you can get, be it the Crytac, the AEK, and, of course, the Ares, but it's, it's a shit gun. The volume of the cylinder, you lose so much with that horrible nozzle shape and the way it moves and works. You've got to use a slightly bigger spring to get normal volumes. The way you have to shim it is a nightmare. Everything about it is fucking terrible. It's such a shit gun. I know the best way to do what you've got to do with it now that the Perrin unit is out, which I'm not tested, I'm sure it's going to improve most of the fucking little issues that cause that gun to be an absolute fucking dead in the water fuck i've had it five minutes it's bollocks stick it on the wall and look at it and go wow i wish i not bought that gun. kind of unit but you shouldn't have to do all that kind of stuff to it and it shouldn't it's not a difficult gun to take apart it's a long-winded process to take it apart and when you've got a circuit board that fucking wank and a trigger that awful and you can team that bullshit up with what is the most frustrating quick change spring mechanism ever it's two pins you pop two pins out, you take the base plate off, you change the spring, right? No. Because you have, you put the new spring and you push that fucking plate up in it with the palm of your hand, you try and get the pin in, the first fucking pin, whichever front or back, whichever you try and do, and it's moving and it's sliding. You end up taking the entire thing upside down, you place it on your bench, and you've got your whole body weight forcing the bottom of the fucking gun down, you're trying to get those fucking pins in. It's like trying to fucking dress a three-legged toddler with epilepsy. It's just a really, really shit design. And the size of the battery space inside it, you need such a big fucking battery in there to get any kind of trigger response. And let's face it, literally sometimes you're pulling that trigger so hard, it's like trying to get the last bit of hooker spit out the top of your pot. Pretty fucking bad. I, I certainly wouldn't want to fucking touch one of those again. The Ares Striker. This is the bolt action rifle that Ares released. The AM, whatever the fuck they want to call it. So you've got a gun that out of the box, the hot rubber is normally going to shred in 10 seconds anyway. That's Ares all over. But retailers love them because they've got all these accessories that all come from UK wholesalers. You can just make anything you want on the fly. You can have it sawn off. You can have it ball barrel. You can have it with a tiny stock. You can have it with a big stock. You can have it with no stock at all. You can do so much with it, but the longevity is about 35 minutes. It's got a really short pull on the bolt. A nice short pull is great, but it's not great. It's a pain in the ass because you lift that bolt and you pull it back and you're using what should be AEG springs. But what I've learned is if you want to get up to the, the decent 2.3 joule kind of mark, if you want to be using a spring that normally do that, and just for the sake of fucking argument, let's say an M150, if you want to do that, you have to put an M170 perhaps. If you want to reach M170 power, you've got to use an M190. And it's inconsistent which springs it actually likes. And the parts, they wear out so quickly. And because you've got such a short bolt pull, with such a wide cylinder, using an AEG style of spring, pulling that bolt handle back is not the easiest thing. You get that build right first time, you've got a really smooth bolt pull for about four, five hundred rounds, then you start to feel it degrade. And like most things when it comes to uh, generations, because, oh yeah, you've got to buy this generation. You know, when that gun came out, the Gen 1 came out, it wasn't the Gen 1, it was just a fucking Ares Striker. It came out, and it was fucking terrible. And I said to people I was working for, I not, no, these are fucking terrible. They're like, yeah, but we can just, we haven't got their tech in, we just do this on the spot, it takes seconds. I'm like, granted, longevity, lifespan, fucking terrible. And I said, look at all these issues. Ah, they don't exist. 
then they brought out the version 2, Gen 2. All the retailers said, yep, yeah, all the issues with Gen 1 that didn't exist in the first place are all fixed in the Gen 2. They're all fixed. Amazing gun. Then the Gen 3 came out. And obviously the Gen 3 fixed all the issues with the Gen 2 that didn't exist. It fixed the fucking issues with the Gen 1 that didn't fucking exist. So what is it? How many Gens are you going to keep fucking releasing? They bring out their own internal parts. You know, wide bore this, tapered that, um, light trigger this. And the parts don't even go in the right gun. Oh, which Gen have you got? You could say Gen 4, Gen 5, Gen 6. Oh, it's not for that one. You know, you can have a fucking, you can have one of each of those guns. And don't fit in any of them. Oh, it worked for that Gen. It's just, it's a fucking license to make money. The Ares Striker, you know, oh god, pull the fucking charging handle back, locks in place, you arm it. If you arm it too hard, after six months of ownership, I guess, if you arm that unit and you slide it forward too hard, it's so easy to push the BB just slightly past the hot rubber and you get about 25 meters of range. You know, you push it nice and slowly and steadily and down, loads perfectly each time. It's awful. Again, one of those guns I won't ever, ever touch again. It's just not worth it. Gas tri shot shotguns. The KSG, less of an offender. The TM870, it's flimsy. It's floppy. It leaks. And people just don't know this. Ask a mate. If you know someone who's got an APS, if you know someone who's got one of the Springers, if you know someone who's got a real 870, put your tri shot down next to it. It's literally three quarter size. It's not even the correct scale. It's a miniature version. It's a miniature version. And the parts on the inside are perfect. 134A, so you can gently rack it and then you can fire it. And it's fine. The parts will last for a good long time if you gently rack it back, gently pump it forward, and then pull the trigger. But if you start really slapping that thing around, it doesn't last very long at all. And let's face it, how many times have you seen people saying, yeah, my fucking shotgun's leaking? Yeah, it will do. It really will. The parts. There are a few upgrade parts that reinforce it, but you've got a leaf spring that lives inside and it's literally foil. It's like a piece of fucking tin foil. It's so thin and you've got to slide it in. You've got to be so delicate and so intricate when you repair it. And it's not a hard job to do, but the second you take on the job, the second you say, yes, I'll fix your gun, you get the parts and you charge for it, that customer gets it back, they put a shell in too hard, they close the gate too hard, they rack it too hard, and it breaks again, you're paying out again. You've got to get to sign a little thing saying, I understand that this thing is so fragile, but then we move on to the Gold Eagle stuff. Now, this is the good shit. Gold Eagle were the people who made it for up, uh, for secretary, 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 Shaka Khan, whatever the f- secretary, you know, any, any fucking gun that has got some kind of Roman looking or sounding name, if your fucking gun is named after or manufactured by or supplied by somebody that looks like their name should be above a little tiny artisan coffee shop, don't buy that gun. Don't fucking buy it. If you see a Roman soldier's helmet anywhere on the shit you're buying, don't fucking buy it. Then you've got the Shakatur, whatever the fucking, how do you want to say it? You've got that version, which is just a rebranded Gold Eagle. And wow, were they fucking terrible. And I warned everyone. I've, I've just seen the first few batches come out. Don't do it. And they got them in 50-50, whether they're fucking leaking or not, dependent on the model as well. And then... Golden Eagle decided to sort of up the quality a little bit of the O-rings and all the other bits and bobs. And the Golden Eagle ones aren't too bad. In a lot of ways, the Golden Eagle lasts actually longer and performs better than the TM. And it is a third of the price. But understand, it is so fragile. It's so fragile and it's three-quarter size of a real 870. Nah, fuck off, mate. Not interested. PTS slash Magpul PDRs. Just something that I dare ever touch again. They had it so close to being good. And there are other things I won't touch. There are other things I won't touch. But I think this is a special mention. There are other things I won't touch, but this is this beats it to the punch. What you've got is a gun that is... It feels good to hold it. Everything about it should be good. But with the absolute lack of any kind of electronic control on the inside... It is just dead. It's dead in the water. It's a fucking book of corpse floating down the Thames. It's not good. 
the semi-auto and all the little plates and sliders and everything, the same kind of shit you would actually get on a Tavor. You get the same kind of bollocks and you can't have to screw too tight, you can't have too loose. And the semi-auto will just go, ah, nah, I don't like it, don't fancy it. The BBs have to travel through the gearbox. That's crazy. I think that is the reason why this is worse than the Tavor design, because the BBs travel through the gearbox. And that'd be fine. You've got to keep that unit clean. But you, how are you going to, you've got to literally buy yourself some fucking rope <laughs> to fucking soak away in some oil and feed it through the nozzle and fucking floss it through to try and get all that crap out. Otherwise, to clean that tube out, if you get some dirt in there, you've got to disassemble the whole gearbox. And then they decided to put the tappet plate spring protruding very, very slightly, a fraction of a millimetre into that feeding channel. They completely designed that gearbox from scratch, and if you match that up with the fact that if they'd have gone with the P90 design, if they'd have gone with the M14 design, where there is a contained spring behind, inside the tappet plate, rather than attached to the bottom like an M4 or AK, if they'd have done that, you'd just be stuck with the fact that semi-auto garbage. But because they didn't do that, this thing is fucking terrible. The AOE is all out. Just, it should be good. It should be good, but it isn't. And they could have fixed it, and they haven't. And the micro switch that comes in it is fucking shite. The gun sounds noisy, it's slow in firing, and honestly, it really is just a massive fail. And I've had to work on so many now, I've had to pull it and go, I'm really sorry, no more PDRs. No more PDRs, because I, it will not work perfectly forever. And first time on the list I'm saying it, if you're gonna do it, HPA it. If you need a PTR, get the cunt hose pipe in there, because you'll be better off. And finally, number one spot, the Bolt MP5 SD series. So who remembers that fucking Bolt MP5 SD I did? Shit show, right? Absolute shit show. Well, the CEO of Bolt actually uh, commented, or he was tagged in a, in a thread on a Facebook group for Bolt in the UK. And um, I popped him a quick message and he arranged for me to get a whole load of spare parts for free. Pistons, the selector cogs, selectors, hop units, and true to his fucking word, he sent out all those parts to me. So I could not only fix that guy's bolt, but I could also work on other people's bolts as well and not have to charge them for parts. Which I thought, you can't argue with that. That's fantastic. However, I had to turn down every single one of the Bolt MP5 SDs that came out of the woodwork after that video. Because I was... The gun is so bad, the design is so bad that it's just not gonna work. It's just not good. Now that bolt, once I changed the parts out, I made a stupid mistake. The gun would have just worked if I changed the fucking selector. It would have been absolutely fine, but because Bolt sent out a whole pile of brand new parts, and because I wanted to make sure the guy got the most out of it, I decided to go in and change his worn hop unit and change the, uh, the other worn parts for the parts that were supplied by Bolt. And that became my undoing because the gun refused to function after that. Selector not working properly, another one of the selector cogs broke, or the little discs broke. Uh, the outer barrel became worse than ever to the point that I deemed it irreparable because if I was going to bond it in some way, I had one chance to get in there and do it correctly. And if I did it wrong, you know, it made the situation worse and I couldn't see a way of doing it right. So I had to go, do you know what? Fuck it, I'm sorry, dude. And I had to tell the customer that his gun was now scrapped. I should have fucking left it alone. Any of the Bolt MP5s that are not the SD flavor, I'm still willing to touch. And I've still got the parts sent to me by Bolt. So I've got one selector disc left. I've got one selector switch left. I've got a couple of hop units left. Um, I've got uh, some pistons left, so that, I'm still willing to touch those, but I'm not willing to go anywhere near the SD because the design of it is so bad. I felt like shit. I felt like shit. It makes you question, you know, am I a good fucking tech? Am I, what, what happened here? Why did this happen? And so I went back into the gun again and found that the cutoff lever had broken. <laughs> the actual cutoff lever snapped and it's like, Jesus Christ, do I want to go back in there? 
and arrange a new part and put a fucking blah, blah. No, it wasn't worth it. That MP5 SD is now scrap in one of my bits boxes. But a customer has sent me out this plastic 65 quid seamer. These are the same ones you can get on Tai One Gun, literally for 65 quid. They are cheap. Cheap. Any of the parts that I changed over in his bolt and any parts from that bolt that I can put inside here, I'm going to. And I'm gonna turn this gun into an absolute fucking beast demon. Now, the guy paid me for my work on that bolt and I don't want him to lose money and I don't wanna lose money either. When you're self-employed, you can't risk that. So, it's a kind of a lose-lose because whilst I'm doing this job for him, I'm not charging him anything for this and I'm gonna put other parts in it free of charge as well so that he gets the best service out of it. So I lose a day of pay, but I'm not refunding somebody. Um, I prefer to give them something out of it. And that is the risk you take when you're self-employed. I wanna very, very clearly point out that I can't fucking moan at Bolt for their service, their aftercare, because what they did was fantastic. And I've never had to work on one of their AKs, not that I can recall anyway, but their M4s and so forth, uh, they're fucking brilliant. They're really, really, really good. I like them. The MP5, I've not seen the full size normal A3, A4 version, and I've never worked on a K either. The only ones I've seen now have been the SD, and I had so many emails about them. It's just something I won't ever touch again. It's just not worth it to me. It's uh, really put a tarnish there. But I'm still gonna continue to work on bolt guns because I think the rest of their lineup is brilliant. So what I'm doing now is I'm going to turn this completely plastic, like the only thing metal in this whole gun is the outer barrel, the body pins, the mag release is plastic, everything, everything, charging handle, it's all plastic. But inside it is what you'd expect from a SEMA gearbox. So let's see what I can do with it. Right, so what I just did there, because it's a very cheap gearbox, lots of rough edges. So radiusing is normal. And then I've smoothed out any of these rough edges here. Because I don't want to crash and scrape on the cylinder if the cylinder happens to rotate or anything. And I've just smoothed out the runners. 99.9% .9 of gearboxes don't need that doing. It's just something that gets charged extra for. Um, but in one of these, it is a rough gearbox. So yeah, for the 10 seconds it takes to do it, who gives a fuck? <laughs> 